تلعب مدينة لوس أنجلوس في ولاية كاليفورنيا والتي تعتبر من المدن الأكثر تعددا للثقافات في العالم دورا مركزيا في تحديد التوجهات الأمريكية فيما يخص الأزياء والصناعة والترفيه وسياحها في حالة من الترقب لإلقاء نظرة على نجوم السينما رغم وجود وسائل الترفيه بكثرة إلا أن هذه المرأة الأمريكية اختارت أن تعيش إيمانها مستبدلة نمط العيش ذاك ببناء علاقات مع من حولها And then when I met the Muslims and I started asking my questions, everything just made sense. And for the first time, I got my questions answered. So then I started learning about Islam, and um, within about six months, I embraced Islam and became Muslim. Living in America, there's a lot of things to do. You can have a lot of fun. There's, there's so many things you can do. So um, we always end up going to the movies or going to hang out with friends. We have dinner, this, that. Hang out with Muslims, non-Muslims, and it's it's not a big deal because as long as you don't go to a situation where like inherently there's haram in it, then you're good. You keep your heart pure and you keep the situation you're in good, and you're fine. فهي تعمل وتعيش في مدينة لوس أنجلوس كأم من عازبة رب طفلين على اتباع طريق الإسلام. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Kawakab and I'm a convert to Islam for um, almost 24 years now. Before I was Muslim, I was baptized Greek Orthodox and I went to a Catholic high school. So I had a lot of different religious backgrounds in there. I studied different religions. I searched for about seven years. I had a book of questions. And then when I met the Muslims and I started asking my questions, everything just made sense. And for the first time, I got my questions answered was who is God, why am I here, what's the purpose of life, you know, things that were out there that nobody wanted to answer, um, or it said were mysteries. Um, they couldn't explain things to me in a way that made sense to the way they dealt with me was not the same as the demeanor of the Muslims. They were, um, it was markedly different. So for me, it wasn't just learning about Islam, it was learning about the people, about the culture, about how they treat one another. That made a huge impact on me. When Kaukab has a problem, when Kaukab has difficulties in her daily life, she comes to us as Muslims. She doesn't go to her family. She gets her support from us. I mean, it's, it's really nice to see that Muslim community is very strong and we help each other, we support each other. The concept of God was very bizarre growing up. I didn't understand how three could equal one. And so when I heard about Islam and they told me about all the attributes of God, this was like eye-opening. I was like, wow, I couldn't believe it. So for me, it was a matter of my mind and my heart accepting something because my mind couldn't accept all the other things that I had looked into and I looked into a lot of things. <laughs> I was working in, um, in a place with a friend and sh she had um, known this, this she, had went, she moved to another location in her work. And I went to visit her and I met my future husband at that time. I met him and he was, we were talking and he said, I'm starting Ramadan next month. And I said, what's Ramadan? <laughs> so he said, well, I'm Muslim. And um, he gave me like a few things. And then he said, you know, I'm learning my religion too. Even though he was born and raised Muslim, he had started learning when he was in California. So he had some friends come over and they came down from Canada and I brought my book of questions and they sat for four hours straight and I drilled them 
question after question after question, and they're very nice. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. There were two things that attracted me. The first was the explanation about God. That made sense to me. All the other things I heard hadn't. And the second thing was they brought everything from Adam all the way through Prophet Muhammad together. That succession of prophets made sense. That God would teach us, give us one religion, and we would be taught by people who would then teach their followers. And so that made sense. And um, the attributes of the prophets and that they were special and chosen and all of those things kind of fell into place. It's almost like the puzzle pieces finally came together. So I think it was really the basic belief of Islam, the belief in God and the belief in the prophets. After the four hours of them sitting very politely and asking questions, and I was like drilling them, they said, do you have any more questions? <laughs> so then I started learning about Islam and um, within about six months I embraced Islam. <laughs> I know Kaukab for more than 25 years now. I remember the first time when I saw her 26 years ago. I was pregnant and she wasn't a Muslim back then. She was looking at me and the way I dress and everything was new to her. She was really very, you know, interesting in asking questions about the religion and all this. And she wants the logic behind this. When I became Muslim, it was a struggle for my family. At first I didn't tell them. I was working for my father and um, he asked me to do something which was sinful to do. And I told him, no, I'm not gonna do that. And he said, I'm, I'm telling you, you're working for me, you need to do it. I said, I'm not gonna do it. So he said, you became Muslim, didn't you? I said, yeah, I did. And he said, I'm calling your mother. <laughs> So he called my mom, and she's not any religion. She was raised in foster homes. Um, her bloodline is Jewish, uh, but she never embraced anything. And so um, she told me, Angie, I'm telling you to do this now. She remembered my American name. And I said, no, I'm not going to do it. So she, she, my dad was screaming, and my mom was screaming, and she came down to the work, and it was an ugly scene. And then uh, things got worse from there. Um, when I started wearing the scarf, my mom didn't go out in public with me for more than 10 years. Any event for the family, I couldn't be invited to because I had to wear my scarf to go in public and my mom wouldn't be there when I was there, so I was excluded from the family. My dad's side of the family completely disowned me. My mother's side of the family didn't want to fight with my mom, they disowned me. She told me later, it was as if I was saying the way she raised me was wrong. And I tried to explain to her, but I found the truth myself. So. It was a difficult thing for my mom to accept. Something happened and then I got divorced and then my, my mom realized, I think it hit home for her that I didn't become Muslim for anyone except myself. Even though I'd become Muslim about a year and a half before I got married, when I got divorced and my mom saw that I was still raising my children in, uh, Islam, in an Islamic environment and I was staying Muslim and she realized this is who I am and she, came to terms with herself. She, she called me and she said, you know, I, I've been prejudiced against my own daughter. And she realized that and she just asked to wipe the whole slate clean and we just started over. So it was, um, it was her realization that she had done something to me, that I hadn't changed other than my religion, was still the same daughter. So I think it was something she had to find within herself and she did eventually. The next year when I came back from, for vacation to stay in the States, I knew that she was a Muslim. We were, you know, friends for a long time. We baked together, we cooked together. For Kaukab, we are like her family because she had, you know, a, a very hard time dealing with her family because she became a Muslim. And to me also, she's a big support. Even my parents, when they come to visit me from Jordan, they told me, this is more than a sister to you. She was with me during sad times, good times. She's a good, good Muslim. And really, really, I didn't see any other person who is very keen to practice the rules of the religion than Kaukab. I'm very pleased and blessed to have her as a friend. 
So till this day, I just have my, my younger sister, we're in contact, we see each other often. And my parents, everything's great now. It's been quite a few years, but it's really good now. And, uh, and they accept that, they know, you know that I am the way I am and I'm happy in my life and now they've accepted that. So we go out in public, we do everything normally as we used to before all of that happened. But it was a really rough 10 years. So when I made a decision to become Muslim, I, I had learned before, so I knew how my life was going to change, and I, was, I had prepared myself for that. If I'm gonna become Muslim, I'm gonna practice, so I wanna understand what do I have to do, what's praying, what's fasting, what's, how do I live my life? So for me, the changes were my choice, and since they were my choice, that was easier. Dealing with people's reaction to me was a shock. I had learned about prejudice in school, nobody, I mean, nobody ever said anything to me about um, that I was you know, different in any way. If I was with Mexican people, I looked Mexican. With Italians, I looked Italian. With Greeks, I looked Greek. It, it was, I always fit in. But when I, when I started wearing my scarf, I felt prejudiced the first time. And I think that was the hardest thing for me. Not so much, you know, learning how to pray, it was exciting. Learning all of the things about Islam, I, I loved that learning. But the hard part was people, their reaction to me. <laughs> There's a lot of things that I do that are just like everybody else. Most things that I do are like everybody else. Um, but it's something that people don't understand. Like, you exercise, you work out, you take walks. It's normal things that everybody does. But because you're different, they think all the things you do are different. I had some very bad experiences when I started wearing my scarf. The first time I started wearing it around people I would never see again. So I went to a store and I went to buy something. And I usually pull the change out of my purse because it's tight to look for the coins. And so it's a habit. I've done it since I was little. I put the coins in my hand and I went to pay. And the woman said, that's a quarter. She spoke to me. I'm like, oh my God, she thinks I don't understand. So it was just the shock. Till this day, I don't know if I ran out of the store without the item or what. But she shocked me so much. I went, I cried in the car. I'm like, oh my God, she thinks I'm stupid. So that was my first real traumatic experience and then I started wearing it around people that you know were acquaintances I wouldn't really you know didn't care really what they thought and that was a little bit easier and then I needed to start wearing it to work and actually a non-muslim friend of mine she came with me to work the day I wore it the first time and she said she stopped me as we were going in and she said stop being nervous if this is the way you want to live your life it's up to everybody else to deal with it so if you feel comfortable they're gonna feel comfortable and that was the best piece of advice I ever got I've had people um, want to throw things at me uh, curse me tell me I'm a terrorist call me a sand nigger very bad things I've had people throw cokes at me while I'm walking in the parking lot with my children when they were young um, people telling me to go back to my country I told them I'm American. <laughs> so um, yeah, people, it's ignorance and you learn to deal with it. And now it doesn't phase me at all now. It just realized that there are people who don't understand things and when they don't understand things, they fear them. And so I learned to deal with that better. And as I learned to deal with it better, I didn't, I didn't take their feelings on. And that made me, it made it easier for me. I didn't cry as much. I didn't think, you know, how am I gonna make people understand I'm not like that? You know, now when I go in for a job interview, you can see a person size you up. You know, they look from head to toe and they think, uh-oh. Um, and then there's other people who are very kind and they, you know, don't look at it and it's, it's, they treat you like any other person. But there's all different types of people in the world and you just learn to deal with them. I had a recent experience where um, I was called, uh, called back from my resume, they liked it. I spoke with a gentleman, he was very pleased with my background. And when I went to meet him, he brought me into another room to meet with uh, a, apparently a supervisor who was a woman who was higher than him. And she conducted the interview with him there. And she literally looked me from head to toe and I could tell in her eyes, she made a split second decision about me. She just didn't like what she saw. I'm there, I'm covered, I'm wearing a skirt. It's too long for today's fashion. Um, she just, she, she made a snap judgment and every question, every time I said something, she said, you know, as if I was offending her, as if I had no answer for why my career is where it is today. I mean, questions were just, I've, I've never had a bad interview like that. Once somebody gets to know you, 
it's much easier because they can look past the scarf and see that it's the way you dress. It's, you know, some people dress one way, some people dress another way. But if they don't give you the opportunity to speak, to hear that you're articulate, to look at your resume and see your education, your experience, they just look at you and they make a decision. She had just received my resume. So she didn't look. She, the thing she saw was how I looked, my appearance. So when someone has an opportunity to hear me speak, like the job I had for six years when I interviewed for them, I was back east at the time and I spoke to the woman on the phone and I had a couple of phone interviews and she said she could hear me smiling through the phone. She liked my voice, I was gonna be doing telephone sales. And when I came in to meet her, she had no problem with me. And she had me meet some uh, male managers and they went to shake my hand and I told them I don't shake hands for religious reasons and I laughed and smiled and told them it doesn't mean I'm not friendly. And they smiled and it was fine. They wanted to shut the door for their interview. I asked them to keep the door open because it was just two of us. No problem. And I got the job. And I was there six years. I moved up from a sales position to a sales management position and from a sales management position to a director's position over three departments. So it's not a matter of being a covered Muslim. It's a matter of getting an opportunity to see past the cover. And there's not, you can't guarantee that everybody's going to be fair or just in that. And that's where the problem comes in in finding a job in America today. In California, when 9-11 happened, I happened to be living in Pennsylvania. It was worse for me during the Kuwaiti War when I was living in California. I had people run me off the road. Um, men would take their their shirts and roll them up over their head and laugh and say ugly things. Um, it was bad. The women in the community, in the Islamic community, um, couldn't go out at night by themselves. Um, people were abusive. But during 9-11, I happened to be in Pennsylvania at that time working in a big corporation, and the people were very kind with me. They, they knew me from working with me. They said, do you want us to take you home? Are you sure you're going to be safe? They were really, really nice. So it was completely different seeing how, I was, how it was handled in the Kuwaiti war and how it was handled in 9-11. By 9-11, there were a lot more Muslims in a lot, in a lot of different areas. And I think people start, you know, now they see us and they're like, oh, OK. Back when I first started wearing my scarf 20 years ago, 24 years ago, I mean, it was uh, mothers bringing their children away from me in a grocery store thinking, I don't know, I have guns with me or something. I don't know what they were thinking. And I would say hi, and I would speak in English, and they'd be shocked. Um, and I'm like, I'm American. I just dress like this because of my religion. Don't be scared. And I would try to talk with the kids or the parents. Some people were understanding, some people weren't. but. Um, it was very different when I first started wearing my scarf because there weren't large Muslim communities. Today, it's very different. You find Islamic stores, you find markets, you find people, you find communities where, you know, it's so common that people don't look twice. They're, you know, it's like, okay, whatever. So yeah. it's, it's a very different world today than it was 20, 24 years ago. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem Bismillahir rahmanir rahim I started learning about Islam from an Arab speaking gentleman um, who was translating from Eng from Arabic material into English material. So they had very few people in California when I embraced Islam in our community and then the community started to grow. So as it grew um, and we they reached out to other um, I guess chapters of the Association of Islamic Charitable Projects, AICP, the organization where I learned from, they sent me to, to someone who spoke English and had materials in English and they retaught me about the Tawheed and the Fiqh. And then um, I took that material and I started teaching. And then over the years I've helped edit um, the summary of the obligatory knowledge in English. I've worked on several documents for our association on the editorial staff, so I've learned from many people, um, especially Sheikh Samir al-Qadi, who was um, living in Pennsylvania at the time that I was there. So for five straight years, we got Islamic teaching. I've been teaching Islam since 1988 to non-Arab speakers, and I teach them the Tawheed and the Fiqh. So I teach them the basic belief and the rules of the religion. And I've been doing this, like I said, since 1988. I've had large classes, small classes, one-on-one. -on -one. I've done it on the phone. Um, 
Today I teach two classes. I take one class and teach two classes. So I have um, some college girls that I'm teaching now. They were um, raised in an Arab home, but not a Muslim Arab home. So they never learned their religion until um, their 20s. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Hafsa and I'm living in California. I'm planning on getting a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and molecular biology by 2013 and I plan to go on med school after that, inshallah. I met Kokub um, when she started teaching me Islamic lessons and she's a very friendly, mashallah. She's a great woman, mashallah. She's very happy, always smiling, yeah. I think it's pretty spectacular that Kokub, as a Muslim convert, is teaching me, a person who was born Muslim, Islam. It's a real accomplishment for her, I think, mashallah. And mashallah, from the knowledge I learn, I'll teach other people someday as well. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Layla Divini. Um, I was born and raised in California. And currently I'm teaching, but I'm going to be going to graduate school next year. I first met Kaukab because we were interested in taking lessons about Islam and um, she became our Islam teacher. Well, being born and raised here and spending a lot of time um, obviously here in California as a Muslim, I think a lot of people have many questions about Islam, especially post 9-11. They want to know a lot of information. I think a lot of people are apprehensive and it takes time for them to get used to the idea of Muslims being part of American society. Um, I think that American society is composed of not just one religion but many religions and people are more interested in, in learning more rather than um, fearful, I think, for the most part people are concerned or they have a friend or somebody from school and they're like, can I bring them to one of your lessons? Can we talk about this? Can you answer their questions? So it's, um, we try to do it as informally as possible to make people feel comfortable about talking about things they don't know about. So um, teaching the religion is a rewardable deed. So anytime you have the opportunity to do it, it's good. Kaukab has been a great teacher and her knowledge base is, is quite extraordinary. She has a lot of knowledge and if she can't answer a question, she always asks somebody else um, for us. I also teach uh, a married, a young married couple. The, um, the girl has been Muslim for quite some time and her, um, her husband embraced Islam recently. So I've been teaching the two of them together. So she's reviewing and he's learning and it's a really nice experience. I, I enjoy teaching them. So I teach two classes. I teach them at the Islamic Center in Anaheim, California. And I've also taught lessons in my home. I've taught lessons in other people's homes. So it's been a long period of teaching. Sometimes I have more classes than other times. I've known Kaukab since uh, I was seven years old. Um, my friends, my uncle, my family, they were all her friends also. She, uh, she came um, in we, to join us and uh, we took lots of uh, care and support of our Muslim community. Um, I've always went to her house, uh, you know, helped her with her kids. Before that, I, she taught me. MashaAllah, Bismillah Alaya Kaukab, she uh, converted to Islam with, you know, all her will. She uh, taught, she learned, and she always wanted to learn more and more, and never gave up. Kaukab is a very special person. She's very special to me. S since I've known her since I was seven years old, and all these years, I mean, she's seen me uh, grow, get married, uh, have kids, and until now we've been, you know, friends and in contact. حب كوكب لأولادها متجذر بعمق في قلبها إن تربية ولدين اعتمادا على نفسها هو تحد حقيقي وكان إيمانها السر في نجاحها. The hardest years were the teenage years, you know, they're, you know, it's the time when they defy their parents and things like that. Um, I want to do this, I don't understand why I can't go here, why I can't stay out late, why I can't have this friend. <laughs> so I think, you know, that was hard for me. I had to teach them how to choose the right friends. Um, today, I don't worry about that. 
my kids know that if they lose my trust, they have to earn it back. And if I don't like one of their friends, like there's things I see in them, I talk to them. I tell them, you know, I saw some things I don't like. And if they can explain to me why what I saw was different from what I perceived, then I'm open to that. But there are some friends I've had to say, um, I don't want you to be friends with that person. This is not a good person to have in your life. You're going to go down the wrong path. So um, I think that respect that we ingrained in our kids, they, you know, they knew when to push and when not to push. So um, the friend thing was a little bit hard, picking the right friends, especially going into high school. You know, it's a tough time in kids' lives, and they start to do things that you don't want them to do. So we just, you know, stayed on top of them and tried to, you know, keep guiding them and giving them options other than the things that kids who were going the wrong way chose. So yeah, teenage years, because they're rebellious. <laughs> so Habibi, how was your first day? Alhamdulillah, my first day was great. How was your day today? It was busy. Did you like your new job? Yeah, it was good. It's not difficult to operate in society while being Muslim, because being on the path of Islam is just a way to operate through your life, and it's a path that you take, just like life. So. It's very easy to get by in America as long as you do what you have to do and stay away from the bad things. Yeah, I have many non-Muslim friends. I went to a high school, a public high school in America, and I made a lot of friends. I'm very personable. People seem to like me. Some of my friends were accepting, like they understood and they, they don't stop me from the things that I need to do. Most of my friends, the ones that I still talk to, actually remind me to pray sometimes and they know that I don't eat non-halal meat and it's very easy to hang out with them like they've become accustomed to it. But I mean some people, there's always the hard people who don't understand and are afraid of what they don't know and don't get so they just didn't stay in my life because I had no need for them. It wasn't worth it to have somebody bring you down and when you can move forward in life. Just being a good Muslim has helped extremely while I'm down and, and not feeling as if I have a way out of things, just rem reminding myself to pray and do the good deeds. And um, it, it really helps you, it really gives you motivation in life to get out there and fix yourself and to better yourself in many ways. You know, it's funny, most people don't know I'm Muslim when they meet me because I'm so like a normal guy. So um, like later on, they'll find out like I'll say something or I don't eat this or I don't do that. And they'll be like, what do you mean? And I'll be like, oh, I'm Muslim. And they'll be like, no, like no one believes me. So, but, um, and, and they accept it like immediately because it's such a non-issue because I act like them so much that it doesn't like register. Like I don't come wearing a turban or like doing like siwak all the time in front of them. So they're not like surprised, like they're just a regular guy. Living in America, there's a lot of things to do. You can have a lot of fun. There's, there's so many things you can do. So um, we always end up going to the movies or going to hang out with friends. We have dinner, this, that. Hang out with Muslims, non-Muslims, and it's, it's not a big deal. Because as long as you don't go to a situation where like inherently there's haram in it, then you're good. You keep your heart pure, and you keep the situation you're in good, and you're fine. So like, when they, when they see it in us, they're just like, oh, you, like even other Muslims, because me and my friends, like we follow more than most people, so they see us and they say like, like you guys are so good together, you're good friends, you do this, you do that, you always advise each other. So they, they want to be like us and it's cool, it's, it's a really nice environment to be in and it's, it's nice to be like the person you are all the time. The way I was raised is the way I'd like to raise my children. So um, I think that, you know, as long as I find a woman who's as good as my mom or better and I turn out like my parents, then inshallah I'll raise my kids just fine. سلام هي حتى مطلع الفجر صدق الله العظيم. Sayyidina Ali said like that people are asleep, like most people are asleep when they wake up, like when they when they die, that's when they wake up. So I think like if you can live your life as if you're awake, that's the best thing you can do in Islam is what provides that. If you really follow the religion, then you can be awake all the time. I think people are becoming, more people are becoming Muslim in America because they're hearing the truth about Islam. They're not hearing, you know, they're willing to listen beyond what the media is saying, beyond the negative things that are being said, trying to find out what is it about, what, what made you become Muslim, why are you, why did you do this thing? Because they used to think it's something from the East, it's something from the, those people. 
And now when you see, you know, blonde hair, blue eyed people becoming Muslim, you see, you know, like your neighbors are Muslim, you see so many Muslim people, you're like, what is that? And I think that's why I think it's the, the era of getting knowledge, of being willing to talk with people instead of fearing them. I'm very happy to be Muslim. I'm very happy to be in America as a Muslim. I don't feel um, uncomfortable with being Muslim. There are things that are difficult, like finding work, especially now. Um, it is difficult for a Muslim to find work today. Um, but I don't regret ever becoming Muslim. I don't regret raising my children Muslim or being a practicing Muslim walking in the community. It doesn't, it's, a, it's a good thing. It's not an unhappy thing at all. Allahu